All right. Good morning. Uh, thank you for bearing with us as we things were a little bit messy as we got started. I am your moderator for the day. My name is Ashley Fick. I am the civic engagement librarian for the library. We invite every legislator with constituents in Johnson County to participate at these. Um, and then just some housekeeping before we get started, uh, please use the form in the chat to submit any questions that you want asked of the legislators today. We do our best to get to all of them. If we don't get to them, I send contact information at the end of each event um, so you can follow up if you'd like to do so. Um, this event also features closed captioning. So if that's a feature that you would like to take advantage of, we encourage you to do so. Um, and then we're gonna just get started with three minutes per legislator to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what's going on in Topeka um, and just give you a little bit of rundown of what's going on in their committees. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I don't know if there's a legislator that wants to volunteer or we can just go in order of who's on my screen. Does anyone feel strongly about getting started? No. Uh, Representative Johnson, would you like to start? You're number one on my screen, so. Well, good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I don't get to uh, get out to Johnson County as much. I do reside on the Leavenworth County side of the 38th district, just a couple miles from the DeSoto border, which I take. The district also goes all the way down, includes Gardner Lake. Up until December 21st, I was a school teacher over here at Baser Linwood uh, in government and criminal justice. And I also spent about 31 years in the criminal justice field in a variety of positions, uh, the last few years uh, in child abuse cases. And so I bring a couple of those things into the legislature. I'm a freshman and I am finding myself in a graduate study class, learning all the little ins and outs. Um, it's, it's amazing to me the volume of reading that's necessary. And I'm afraid at times I just, I find myself not knowing what, what's really going to happen in the next few minutes, and then I have to talk to someone. But uh, it's been a pleasure to serve, and we have some wonderful people in Topeka. I really sense that they care about the people they vote, uh, that they, they're working for, for the voters, and that's been good for me. Thank you. Okay, if there's not another volunteer, Senator, or Senator Representative Day, you're next in line. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and so I represent House District 48, which is in South Overland Park. Um, the boundaries are 119th Street to 151st, Schweitzer over to Antioch, and then bumps out to Metcalf a little bit. So it's a, a very compact, small square, but um, full of, uh, of wonderful voters. We had great turnout in 2020 here. Uh, I was um, appointed to replace Dr. David Benson, who had won his election in 2018. And then when the COVID uh, pandemic hit, he decided that he, it was time for him to move. Um, so he moved uh, away and I, I, I was asked to step in and I was just absolutely honored to do so. Uh, and then I ran for re-election with just a four month long campaign and, and managed to win by 62 votes. And Dr. Benson had only won by a little bit over 70 votes. And this is where it comes in so important for folks to be reminded that every vote matters in these elections. Um, I am like uh, Representative Johnson, even though I'm, I'm not technically a freshman to, to say, you know, like that, but I, I was a freshman. This was the first time I've done a full session. And it was, I see it the same way. It was kind of like going to college. We're going to our committees and um, I see those as being kind of like classes and, and I learned a lot, but I also felt like uh, the committees that I wound up being assigned to, which, which were taxation, uh, financial institutions, and rural development, as well as um, uh, corrections and juvenile justice, were just absolutely fantastic committees for, for, for me to be able to give my perspe perspective on. So I, it, was, it was a good time. The, the committee work was, was the first uh, couple of months, and while we did some floor work, these last couple of weeks have been uh, floor heavy where we were in the chamber and, and doing a lot of voting. So um, this week in particular, uh, was it's, this is a good week for folks to be on this legislative coffee. There's We probably have a lot of information for you. So I'll let us get to it. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful that Representative Johnson is joining us um, and to, to have Representative Clayton and Stogsdill and, and Senator Holscher uh, with us. It, it really is, we're a great group of 
of seasoned representatives who are going to be able to help us out with the, with filling in the blanks. Thank you so much for having us. I really love these events. Representative Clayton, would you like to go next? Yes, I would be happy to. Good morning, everyone. And um, I'll echo Representative Dave's sentiments. It's very nice to see everyone on here, uh, especially Representative Johnson. We don't sit on the same side of the aisle and we're not in any of the same committees, but I see you working hard and I appreciate the work that all of you are doing for your constituents. Uh, my committees, or rather I'll start with my district boundaries. I represent the 19th district, which means absolutely nothing to any of you, uh, but um, my boundaries are from Metcalf to state line, mostly 83rd to mostly 99th. But if you live in Mission Farms near Rye and Tavern at Mission Farms, I'm your representative. And if you live in Avenue 80 and Avenue 81 in that new, newly developed area of downtown Overland Park on the east side of Metcalf, I'm also your representative. And uh, so my committees are, I start the day with federal and state affairs, which uh, is a very controversial committee uh, it, that usually handles a lot of our uh, gun legislation, gambling, medicinal cannabis. And then I move on to the business sector where I uh, am the ranking minority member on the commerce and labor and economic development committee. And I close up the day with some logic and numbers on taxation where I get to serve with representative Stogstill and Day. Um, I'm also the House Minority Whip, and so uh, part of that role is getting to know the caucus, understanding where we are on issues, and sometimes working with my colleagues across the aisle to see what types of legislation we agree on. I found myself working with moderate Republicans and also with very conservative Republicans to get some legislation out of committee and to get some legislation passed. In addition to that, I serve on the Rules and Journal Committee. So if any of you are real legislative wonks and you're watching our proceedings, every once in a while, germaneness or a breach in the rules will be challenged, which warrants a meeting of the Rules Committee. And so that is a group where we go back, we uh, work things out, and we determine whether something is within our rules or whether an amendment is pertinent to the underlying bill. It has been a very busy, uh, constant breakneck speed session, and we are still very much in the middle of it. A lot of things still have as of yet to be resolved when we return from our three week break, which actually started yesterday evening. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you for having me this morning. Okay. Senator Holscher, you're next on my list if you'd like to go. Certainly, thank you so much. Good morning, thank you for doing this once again. Um, I always enjoy these updates um, and being able to see uh, constituents and other people across Kansas. Um, maybe someday we'll see you in person again, but I am great and so uh, appreciative of this format and still being able to connect with people. Um, I'm Senator Cindy Holscher. My district that I cover is District 8 which goes from 91st Street down to 135th, and then from Flum to Metcalf. Um, it is all Overland Park area. Um, previously, I was a representative for District 16, which covered that area, plus a little bit of Lenexa. So I do miss my Lenexa section, uh, but still hold it all very dear and, and try to make sure I'm working to represent the people in that entire area. Um, it's been an interesting session. I, as mentioned, I started out as a representative, uh, came in at the same time as Representative Stogsdale, I believe, uh, worked with Stephanie previously, and uh, got to work with Jennifer just a little bit. So uh, miss my friends on the other side, and Timothy, I, I don't even know if I formally have met you yet, but it's good to see you. So uh, it's interesting, I tell people this, you know, sometimes people will ask me, well, you know, have you seen so-and-so or, or talked to them? And honestly, if you're in the house, you know, the Senate could be like a totally different plan. You may not see each other the entire session, which seems kind of odd in a way. Um, but it's, you know, each each chamber is kept very, very busy the entire time we're there. Um, this has been, um, like I said, a very interesting session with a lot of bills that were controversial coming out. Um, my particular committees that I work on are commerce, public health, and insurance. Um, and some good bills came forward, especially out of commerce. Um, we have a, a good committee there with good working relationships. Public health saw some very concerning bills coming forward. Um, insurance, not so much, but I, I'm sure we'll get in depth 
a little bit more on some of those specifics coming forward. But again, thank you so much for having me and it's great to see all of you. Representative Stogsdale, feel free to wrap, close us out. Thank you. It's uh, really good to be here this morning and it's nice to uh, uh, see everyone who's attending this morning, or at least your names on the screen. And uh, I'm certainly hoping that it won't be uh, too far until uh, into the future before we can all get together in the same room again. Uh, this is nice, but uh, uh, having the opportunity to be in the same room and talk to people one on one and so on like that, that's uh, it's what we would all prefer, obviously. Uh, I'm Jerry Sogso. I'm serving my third term in the Kansas House of Representatives. And my district is District 21. It runs from uh, uh, 67th Street to 83rd and Metcalf to State Line. So it takes up most of Prairie Village and parts of uh, uh, Leewood, Overland Park and Mission Hills. So uh, my uh, three committees that I serve on, uh, I start my morning uh, on the Water Committee. And actually it's a special two year committee. And we are looking at uh, uh, all of the uh, 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 situations that impact water in Kansas. And I thought, well, this is going to be kind of a little, I don't know whether it's going to be the greatest uh, committee to work on, but it has been fascinating. And it is an extremely important committee because water is going to be a huge issue in Kansas over the next few years. And uh, most of this, this year has been learning about water and the uh, organizations that manage it and so on like that. And next year is when we actually put the plan together and uh, develop legislation to uh, implement some of those plans. So uh, uh, that's my first committee. My second committee is I'm ranking Democrat on the education committee. And as you can imagine, that is, a, that is an interesting committee. And we have had some very interesting issues come out of education this year. And I'm sure there will probably be some questions about that. And my third committee is taxation. And again, like uh, Stephanie said, it's a real pleasure to serve with uh, Jennifer and Stephanie on, uh, on that committee. And uh, I'm just uh, uh, glad to be here this morning. And we're on the first part of a three week break. I'm kind of uh, uh, looking forward to that a little bit, but as Stephanie said, we've got a lot of important issues to deal with still when we get back to Topeka in early part of May. So looking forward to your questions and uh, thank you for being here this morning. We'll go ahead and get into our first question. We have three minutes per legislator to answer each of these questions. Uh, are you in favor of a nonpartisan independent redistricting commission? Why or why not? I just, I don't know who wants to jump in on this. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It was one of the things that, um, that I mentioned throughout my campaign because uh, 2020 was a census year. Uh, we, we will have redist redistricting happening um, hopefully before 2022. Um, but things got pushed out a little bit because of COVID. Uh, however, the, the work is gonna be fast and furious. We do not have an independent um, commission in um, in our state right now, I believe the legislature is the one and uh, who, who they do the work to do the redistricting. And in the past that has led to um, some court interaction on that. And that happens across a lot of states. Um, that's why I think independent com commissions are really important if we can put them into place. I don't know that there's a plan to do so still but I would certainly be in favor of, of pushing for that. Thank you. I'll echo that. Um, yes, very much in favor of, um, of redistricting being done that way. Um, and I think, you know, part of that goes back to the fact that what was it over a year ago when former Senate President Susan Wagle said that, you know, she wanted to make sure that lines could be drawn to be, uh, you know, basically to favor her party, her candidates. Um, in such a way to make it harder for other candidates to win. So I think with that put out there, um, th that kind of sent the message that, okay, we need a nonpartisan uh, group to do this because, I mean, you know, why wouldn't you want to draw your district to benefit yourself? So having it in the hand of legislators doesn't really seem to be make the most sense to most people, and it doesn't to me either. So um, I would really, really prefer to see a nonpartisan group do that. 
I went ahead and raised my hand. Um, I also support a nonpartisan redistricting commission. I think that there are a lot of different ways that we can do this because just because we say something is nonpartisan doesn't mean that it actually is. We've got um, a lot of people talk about states that have the gold standards. I act standards for that. I really like the Ohio model. Um, some people tend to favor Iowa's, but again, I think that the less political it is, the better. But then again, um, sometimes that uh, road to hell is paved with those good intentions. Um, I do, I am a member of the redistricting committee on the House side. And so I think one of the important things here is to follow those rules that we need to follow, make sure that districts are representing uh, communities of interest uh, and that there are, you know, that no bias is really put forth. And so that's going to be a lot of, you know, mor morality, uh, moral heavy lifting, honestly, when you think about it. It's especially important for Johnson County because our population, although we don't have the official census numbers, anyone who lives here has seen the way that our population has exploded in just the past 10 years. I know that my district's population has gone up significantly because of all of the new redeveloping. And so I know that a lot of our districts will shrink in geographical size as our population becomes more dense. And so when we look at that, especially redistricting plays a major important role in Johnson County and how those districts are going to look. But again, just trying to conduct ourselves with the least amount of bias and understanding that voting district lines and those voting rights are really sacred principles on which our country is founded. And so as long as we keep that mindset and keep our morality about us as we conduct ourselves, a, non, a nonpartisan commission would have been better but we don't have that. You guys are stuck with us uh, drawing these lines. And so it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we are doing this in the best way possible. Yeah, I'd like to just echo what uh, Stephanie said. And uh, uh, this is going to be an especially uh, interesting and important redistricting time uh, because, uh, uh, and I'll give you a little background on why, uh, two years ago, two summers ago, during the interim, uh, I attended along with uh, four or five of my colleagues from here in Johnson County. We went out to uh, Lindsburg, Kansas to attend a, uh, uh, a meeting called Meet in the Middle. And it was basically about rural revitalization out there. And I thought that there ought to be some urban legislators that come out and learn more about that because it's obviously, uh, they represent an important part of our economy and so on like that. And they had a professor from Kansas State who uh, gave a presentation out there. And this guy is, is, is world known as a uh, demographer and uh, an expert in population shifts and so on. And he gave a presentation on population shifts in Kansas. And uh, the, uh, uh, he pointed out that when this census comes out, Kansas will officially be an urban state. And that is a, that's the first time in the history of Kansas that has happened. And so uh, redistricting uh, uh, with those urban areas and so on, it's going to actually take away some of the, uh, uh, or it's gonna expand some of the districts out west and it's going to give us more districts uh, here, particularly in the northeast part of, of Kansas and down around Sedgwick County and so on. So this is gonna be a critical redistricting uh, effort this year. And I'm much in favor of a totally neutral uh, organization coming in and doing the redistricting. Uh, we should take as much of the politics out of this as possible, in my opinion, uh, because and by doing that, I think it helps all of our constituents be assured that uh, that uh, these districts are, are done fairly and can represent the best interests of our constituents. And that's that's the bottom line right there. So uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. And uh, uh, we'll hope for the best here. But uh, I have a feeling it uh, it may end up. Uh, I believe in 2010, it ended up in the courts and uh, it may end up there again. I hope not, but uh, 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 if we can't get it done, I think maybe an independent uh, organization to come in and do it is the way to go. Well, that leaves me. Let's see, I have a district that's two to one Republican over Democrats. Sure, I want to get, <laughs> uh, the whole concept of redistricting has always been an issue in, in the United States. One of my big concerns is uh, that they're holding back the census results. We should already have those. Uh, 
and I think they're being held for whatever reason, and, and that worries me. Um, I do know that my district is going to change just because of the growth patterns that uh, we just talked about. The city of Baser has uh, of a housing boom. So I probably uh, will lose some of my district to the south in Johnson County. Uh, I just understand that's part of the process. But I'm also not afraid of a, an impartial committee. I, I easily would, would be happy going into the Bonner, Bonner Springs. I have a Bonner Springs mailing address, but I live about a mile into Leavenworth County. I grew up in Wyandotte County. Uh, I'd be very happy back there with some precincts. Doesn't bother me at all. Uh, but it, it is going to be a challenge. And I, I personally, I do think it will end up in the courts. That's just my experience uh, in the study of this. And uh, maybe that's the best thing to let the courts break it up so that we won't have the arguments between the two parties. So my thoughts. And just as a side note, the league would like to invite anyone that wants to take part in a raising awareness and advocating for fair maps in Kansas during the league's people powered fair maps week of action. I got that right. And I didn't, my tongue didn't twist on it, although it twisted as I was saying, I got it right. Um, and you can learn more at lwbk.org. We're going to post a link in the chat as well. Um, so our, that leads us to our next question. When the legislature returns to Topeka on May 3rd, what happens next and what legislation will be addressed at that time? Well, when we return, uh, usually that time is, you know, it's referred to as veto session. Uh, now, especially when uh, Stogsdill and Holscher first started, uh, it was anything but. We usually left everything to the very last minute. Uh, but let's see, so both chambers have already uh, considered at least one budget of a sort, although the Senate did reject a pretty significant portion of our budget when they voted down an education policy bill that was tied to appropriations. And so I think a lot of legislators have some heartburn about that. So I think we will be reworking those portions of our budget to see the way that that works out. Um, and then of course, it's called the veto session for a reason, right? We will see what the governor does and if she does choose to veto either portions of the budget, which is within her purview, she can do line items there or entire pieces of legislation. Uh, we passed uh, quite a bit of things in these past couple of days in both chambers. And so if she does veto that, then that gives our collective legislative bodies the opportunity to consider either overriding those vetoes or letting those vetoes stand. Um, we could also uh, take that vote and end up sustaining vetoes. And so sort of that last bit of negotiation as we come to the very end of the session. But so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. So a lot of it is uh, the ball is very much in the governor's court. We've sent a lot of stuff downstairs from the third floor where our chambers are to the second floor where her offices are. And it remains to be seen some of the things that we will end up taking up for consideration when we reconvene in May. I'll jump in. Um, it'll be interesting to see what veto session is like in the Senate this year. Uh, we do have new leadership in terms of the Senate president. Obviously, you probably saw the news yesterday. The Senate majority leader um, was removed from his position. Um, and to kind of preface all of that, this past week in session normally would have been used as a time to review what we call the conference committee reports, basically when a few members of the House and a few members of the Senate get together and kind of work on some bills where there were differences. So that happened. But additionally, we were back on GO, general orders. Normally, you don't have general orders during that time period. Um, so and, and some of those bills that we heard this week were very concerning bills. Um, a lot of things that came through kind of at the last minute, as well as some other things that had kind of been sitting there uh, that, you know, got put on agenda for this past week. So, like I said, it'll be kind of interesting to see what veto session looks like um, under this new leadership. And again, based upon, you know, what the, what the governor may veto and what the chamber may try to override. Uh, we, there is a supermajority in both chambers as far as the Republican Party. So um, I'm sure they will use some strategy in determining which bills they wanna bring back and try to override 
Um, but like I said, you know, there are some kind of questions as far as what that session is going to look like um, in terms of actual veto session or other business. I might add, I think Cindy and, and Stephanie uh, covered things pretty well there. Um, uh, and uh, Cindy's right, uh, there is a Republican supermajority in both the House and the Senate. But the uh, good news, and, uh, we've had several controversial bills come through the House this year, and uh, uh, the votes on those bills did not reflect a supermajority. So uh, I think some of these bills that are going to be coming back to us uh, from the governor uh, it's not necessarily a done deal that because the uh, uh, the Republicans have a supermajority in the House that uh, uh, they will be able to uh, override the governor's vetoes. Um, we've had a controversial gun bill. We've had some controversial education bills, and uh, those bills did not pass with a veto-proof majority. So it'll be interesting to see what the governor decides to veto and what are return what those uh, are what issues are returned to us in the house and uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting veto session for me of course it's all going to be new I, and I haven't seen this but I will tell you this last two weeks as I've watched the conference committees I understood from a government standpoint what a conference committee was but I did not understand what really happened in there as I watched the bills get gutted and then something else put in um, I work very hard on the K through 12 education committee. And then all of a sudden at the very end, basically we had four major bills all in one asking people to vote on it. And how do you explain that to your constituents? I like this part, I like this part, I like this part. And I'm not crazy about this one, but I got to vote on it all together. Um, is that poison pill or something? That I'm trying to learning my terms. That was hard to try to figure out how I could explain. I felt very good about the amount of money that we were putting into the, the education generally, but some of the other issues there are very challenging. So I, I do expect a real battle on those. On the other hand, I was very fortunate in one of the conference committees, uh, the, one of the, my first bill ever on the uh, veterans home got added to um, Susan Estes brought a bill, and I really feel like we helped some people in criminal justice and public safety, along with our military people. And I, and that's already good, good to go. And I've already been told it's going to get signed by the governor. And to me, that is the part. I know Jeff, uh, Senator Pittman helped us on that. Probably saved our bacon. There is some bipartisanship going on in there. Not always, and I know I'm a Republican and we have the majority, but I really think there's a lot of us that, that are looking to get things done for our voters. Thank you. And I think everybody's um, said everything very well so far. I, I'm not sure if everyone who's who's on this um, in this meeting uh, understands what, so we are, we are off for three weeks, um, during which time I'll continue to to receive, we all receive emails from our constituents that you can still send emails to us and let us know what your thoughts are on the remaining legislation that's coming up. What's you know happening with the, uh, with the, the bills that have been sent to the governor. Um, and then we'll be back um, in May, at the beginning of May. And as I understand it, signy die, I think is it on the 26th was what we were told, right? So we'll have a couple of weeks there to discuss these bills and, and see um, and who knows, maybe something will, I don't know, can we have general orders again? We might have geo, right? So it's, uh, it, it, again, this, uh, like uh, Representative Johnson, this is something that, that I'm learning as I go as well. Um, and I agree. I think that one of the difficult things about being a legislator, being a new legislator and being a, a seasoned legislator is this fact that you get good things rolled up with the bad and you have to choose which way you're going to go on it based on just how how bad that bad is to you um, and to your district and, and, uh, and what you're hearing from, from folks in your district or beyond to let you know uh, how it would impact them. So um, it, it's very important that we all keep an open mind. The supermajority is impactful. I, I honestly think sometimes we have caucus meetings before we go onto the floor to vote and 
there's uh, there's just a handful of us really compared to the super majority. And I wonder how hard it is to have that meeting. There's twice as many as a, of them as there are as, of us um, and how, how it might be hard to have your voice heard in, in that sort of situation. Um, and I, I certainly, respect and, and as Jerry mentioned too, um, Representative Johnson has, has shared some thoughts at the well uh, that have been really um, impactful and important for me to hear as a former teacher um, and just a, a you know all around great legislator. So um, that that's my take on it. I just want everybody to remember that we're gonna have those couple of weeks off here, uh, but still feel free to reach out to us about legislation if you have thoughts on it. We actually have a gotten quite a few questions about the partisan divide. So here are two that kind of sum up what we've been seeing. Today we have both Republicans and Democratic legislators so they can each address this question. Is there any legislation you had hoped that would pass this year and did not make it through the process? What was the legislation and why did it matter to you? How did it get stalled? And then we have a second one. This form appears to be heavily Democrat oriented. Why aren't you doing something for us Republicans and to the legislators? Why are you one-sided in your legislation endeavors? I guess uh, I would, I'd be happy to speak to the partisan divide because I have served, I spent six years in the legislature as a Republican and I'm now in my third year serving as a Democrat. So uh, first things first, uh, I think that a lot of times, you know, I think First of all, as to where there are, uh, why there are more Democrats in this particular form than Republicans, I think a lot of this, they, they send out a list of dates to us and then we all kind of pick. So I think that there might be other dates where you have more Republican legislators than Democrats. Uh, and so, but I do think it's important to, although, you know, yes, obviously this is a two party system under which we serve. But I think ultimately the most important thing for us to do as legislators is to listen to everyone, regardless of uh, what side of the aisle our constituents are on. And of course, we all represent a pretty healthy amount of independence in some of our districts as well. Um, I think that one of the things that we should always remember is, uh, especially in the House, we have a voting board where it lights up green or red for uh, whether we're voting yes or no. And I mean, I think about 90% of the time, Representative Johnson and I are voting on uh, the same way, uh, regardless of our parties, because there are lots of things that we agree on. And so I think focusing from that standpoint and moving from where we can work together, and then uh, as we get closer to the end of this legislative process, the end of our legislative calendar, when we come back for veto session, it really is about hammering out those differences. But um, but yeah, so having served in both uh, capacities as a Republican and a, as a Democrat, people ask me a lot about the differences, but honestly, I'm struck by the similarities in the ways in which we conduct ourselves. So I can say for uh, you know basically every member of the Johnson County delegation, even though they're not all on here, that we really are looking at this from a standpoint of how do we do good and how do we get our constitutional duty accomplished, which is to present you all with a balanced budget because that is our chief role and that's uh, making sure that we are appropriating the funds correctly. Yeah. I'll jump in. You know, a lot of people don't realize, but you know, I don't know what it is, 90% of the uh, bills that we vote on, you know, are pretty close to unanimous as far as, um, you know, Republicans and Democrats voting on things. You know, the ones that get the main attention though are, course, Medicaid expansion, uh, value them both, the things that you see more in the press where there are bigger differences on. Um, uh, you know, I will say like, you know, whenever I first entered the, uh, the House chamber, you know, right up front early on, you know, a lot of my time was spent just making relation, you know, establishing relationships with people in my party as well as across the aisle. Um, same thing now in the Senate. Um, and I have strong relationships on both sides of the aisle. So there's some great people I serve with, some people I really enjoy being around. Um, and, you know, hopefully that helps going forward and moving some legislation. I will tell you, you know, one of the things that is very notable about this session, and I'm sure it happened in the House too, uh, because of COVID and the timing from last year hitting in March, there was a lot of unfinished business. So we were very busy early on addressing some of the bills and it, it kind of got to be a little bit of a broken record. You know, we get ready to hear a bill and it's like, this one is from last year when COVID hit and, you know, 
stop session. So we had several bills that were picked up from last session that uh, were basically reheard um, and then moved forward. So a lot of makeup work, catch up work in that regard. And then some new bills that came forward. Um, I had several bills uh, that didn't get a hearing partly because of that log jam, but um, also just because, you know, maybe it wasn't palatable to the particular chair of a committee. Um, one of those bills deals actually with uh, the Albers case here in, um, in Johnson County in regard to police records. It's an important bill uh, that allows some transparency in regard to use of excessive force um, and ensuring that, uh, that there's some accountability with law enforcement. Um, and interestingly, one of the supporters of this type of initiative um, is the chairperson of the Republican party. So, um, you know, we have a good relationship. And so hopefully going forward, we'll be able to work more on that as well. Um, another bill that I had started with last year is in regard to um, statute of limitations in regard to sexual assaults in civil cases. That bill got a hearing last year, uh, was viewed quite favorably, and then was referred to the Judiciary Council to review over the interim. So uh, we have some recommendations on it. It was not picked up for a hearing, but it's a very important bill. Um, I was able to do some work behind the scenes in regard to some of the uh, the work that needs to be done for victims of sexual assault. So some things, uh, sometimes some good changes can happen that doesn't require legislation. So I'm always trying to do that type of work, but hopefully next year, um, some of these important issues can come back and we can move them forward. Uh, for me, again, this is all new, but one of the bills that I think maybe is the most important one that I saw out was the Adrian's law or bill. Louis Ruiz out of uh, KCK did a marvelous job of getting that introduced. I didn't get to follow it because it wasn't on my committees and we got it through. Uh, the house went, went well, yet it wasn't getting called up. And I, I didn't, that's hard for me to understand because I think this is one of the most critical bills that, that, that we saw in the house. And then it came up in, in uh, conference committee. And I honestly, as of this morning, I'm not sure where it's at. If anybody does, tell me because that bill needs to be finished and sent to the governor. And I'm having trouble tracking things that got put into these conference committees or moved around. And I'm bottom of the totem pole, so I don't know what leadership's going to call up. I, I don't go into those meetings. But if I was to ask for one bill that I want to see come up, it would be that bill. Thank you. I've got a list <laughs> that I would like to see uh, come up. And, uh, but I think the number one thing to me, and it's just unconscionable that we have not passed Medicaid expansion, especially in a, in a year like we've had with this pandemic and everything. And we have tens of thousands of Kansans uh, who, don't basically don't have any health care insurance and and in in uh, reality that leaves them without health care uh, in, in a lot of cases and we brought it up again this year and it was shot down again this year and we didn't even get a a, a committee hearing on it we had to bring it up as an amendment and over the last several years we have sent billions of Kansas tax dollars to Washington DC which are then redistributed for healthcare costs to all of the other states who have passed Medicaid expansion. So, you know, these states ought to be sending us thank you notes for paying for part of their healthcare. And everybody said, you know, it's, it's well, we, they said we can't afford it. And uh, that, that's just not the case because we are affording it only it's, gonna, it's all of us, all of our constituents and everyone who are paying the price of that because we're, we're, we're turning down hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funds to come back to Kansas. And those 150,000 or so Kansans who have no health insurance, if you've got a sick child or a sick wife or a husband or something like that, and uh, uh, you have to get them help, uh, you're gonna take them to an emergency room. And emergency rooms cannot turn people away. So they have to treat them and that, 
the hospitals eat that cost. Well, guess who ends up paying for that? We all do through higher hospital costs and, and, and the higher insurance costs. So Kansans can either pay for it out of their own wallets or they can uh, get that money back from the federal government to pay 95% of those costs in uh, Medicaid, for Medicaid expansion. I think, again, I just think it's unconscionable. And uh, uh, I think that that is, is been the number one irritant for me for my five years in the legislature. And, uh, and we've had an opportunity to pass it every year and we still haven't done it. So that's, that's my bill. And just speaking from my own perspective uh, on the bipartisanship or the, the party line issue, um, I too was, I was a Republican until 2016. Um, I registered as one when I was 18. So for the majority of my life, um, I was a, a voting Republican, although I tended to vote more for the, uh, the candidate than the letter next to their name. Personally, it was something that my parents taught me, but, um, and so it's, you know, you have to do your research. Always, it's easier to do research these days than it was uh, back in the 90s when I first started voting. Um, but uh, I have to say, coming into the legislature uh, and, and seeing how things work in these committees, uh, taxation committee is one of the largest committees that I'm on. Um, and I, I feel like the majority of the, the stuff that we're putting through that, the legislation that we're working through on that committee is uh, bipartisanly received. Uh, we, there's, there's very few things that we tend to disagree on and vote uh, against the Republicans on in that. Uh, and Jerry might have a different perspective on that from me, but I, I, have, I have a really good time in that committee. But juvenile justice, the corrections and juvenile justice was by far my most busy committee, uh, believe it or not. It's a smaller committee. Um, I am one of the non-lawyers uh, on that committee. And um, so I bring a very layperson perspective to it. Um, and I was just so impressed by the work that we were doing that uh, followed up on what the State Sentencing Commission um, and the Kansas Criminal Justice Reform Commissions were doing for the last couple of years to try to make sure that um, our justice system in Kansas is more fairly um, applied, as well as uh, the statutes are, are helpful to the judges, to the lawyers that are working on making sure that people are, are being sentenced fairly. Um, and, and making sure that we get through that. So uh, we did a lot, of, a lot of work and passed a lot of uh, legislation through. Um, I, I was one of the freshmen, the few freshmen who carried a bill both for, uh, for juvenile justice um, as well as uh, financial institutions. I'm looking forward to possibly carrying a, a, a taxation bill here during the veto session. Um, and it's just an honor to be able to uh, be trusted with that uh, process to, to carry a bill on the floor, um, which as a Democrat, I, I think is unusual uh, to, to have some, a freshman Democrat, no, no less, um, to carry those bills. And I, I really think that speaks to the respect that we have for each other um, in the legislature. It's, and, and while my vote win was very narrow, um, I have to respect the fact that my, my district is, is, um, is interesting in that, in that regard with the layout. Um, I do have to remember that you know the reason why I ran is why people voted for me. So, uh, and I stand for very specific things. That's, that's where I come from on, on my perspective. So appreciate it. All right. Uh, this one is a, uh, directed to Representative Day, but anyone that wants to speak to it is certainly welcome. Representative Day, thank you for serving on the Juvenile Justice Committee. Uh, what recommendations do you have for the diversion programs and redemption? Oh gosh, that's a very specific question. Um, and again, as the layperson on the committee, I'm not, I'm not sure that I've done a whole lot of research on that. Um, so it, it, it sounds like juvenile justice has gotten, it, the, the system in our, in our state has gotten really uh, tidied up over the last few years. And we have so uh, way fewer juveniles in our juvenile detention system than we did just a couple of years ago. I think we're down to just uh, like 150 kids that are that are being held. So um, I am, um, I'll look into that some more. I appreciate the question. Uh, but I, I can't speak to it specifically at this point in time. It, it, it didn't come up a whole lot. We did the work that we did was a majority um, for adult justice and, and corrections in that committee. All 
it looks like nobody else wants to speak to it. So, um, but the league also does have a upcoming program on Sunday, Saturday, excuse me, May 1st to learn about alternatives to the incarceration of youth in a panel discussion about how to hold youth accountable. That'd be great. Oh, it looked like Rep Johnson might have something to say actually. Oh, about that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I just jumped in there. One of the programs that state of Kansas started I guess I'm gonna say 20 plus years ago, community corrections programs, where you're keeping people in their homes, is probably one of those concepts we need to expand. And I'm not on that committee because I asked specifically for education and uh, the children and seniors, but I see that as a way in which we keep people at home, keeping them in their uh, programs that they need if the younger kids, they need to be in school, a real school, not in a juvenile justice education program because I've watched those and they don't work. We've got to get them back in the community and that's where I hope that we will continue to fund. I don't know, maybe Representative Day knows. I, I, I don't follow it, I haven't had time, but are we funding that properly You know, for the kids, for, for the community programming? because that's where they belong, or at least that's my opinion, where they belong, as opposed to in jail. All they learn to do there is to be a better crook. Giving an extra long time, just in case, <laughs> since I jumped in too early. So I did post the information about the league's upcoming program in the chat. Uh, our next question, legislation that would have Expanded voucher programs in Kansas failed yesterday, but barely. I'm worried about continued legislative efforts to divert public dollars to private schools. Do you further expect do you expect further action on this issue in the current session? If not, do you expect it next year? What can concerned citizens do at this point? I'll just um, jump in. Um, you know, one thing you learn about Topeka, bad bills never die. Um, the topic of vouchers comes back every session and sometimes in a different form. Sometimes it's packaged a little differently. Sometimes it has a different name, but it keeps coming back. Biggest thing that you as constituents, as voters can do, keep putting pressure on people, um, you know, and put pressure on your direct legislators, but also the committee members, um, you know, and sometimes uh, I, I think that people don't realize that, you know, it's appropriate to email committee members who are serving on education, those particular committees, because sometimes you're talking about a pretty small group that's decided to move forward a bill that impacts the entire state. So of course your voice is important to hear in that situation. Um, but you know, like I said, yeah, uh, bad bills never die. So good chance we'll see another form coming up. Um, if not this session, guess what? Next session, I'm, I'm sure there will be another version of it. But, you know, the, the again, the important point is um, let your legislators know you're watching. Um, it's harder for it's harder for a legislator to vote for a bad bill like this Frankenstein bill that we had if they know people are watching. Yeah, I might add on that that uh, you have to really uh, watch for the terminology they use too. Uh, they never use the word voucher. It's scholarships, that sort of thing. And, uh, and uh, so, and it, it, they make it sound better than it actually is, but you get right down to it, it's voucher systems. And vouchers do nothing but take public tax money and give it to private schools. And we have some very good private schools. I have a couple of good private schools right here in my district and so on. And to be quite frank, I've never heard a word from them as far as this, uh, as this issue goes. That does not seem to be a big thing with them. But uh, uh, the fact is that, you know, these uh, private schools and so on, uh, they don't have to accept every child. They can cherry pick kids that come into that system. So uh, uh, I, have, I have never, I never have supported vouchers, never will support vouchers. My position is totally clear, public money for public schools. So uh, that is an issue, though, that uh, that does keep uh, rearing its ugly head every session, and they come at it from about half a dozen different ways. So we really have to pay attention to it. And again, it's part of this whole thing, too, uh, which I think ought to be illegal is bundling bills, that they will stick that in with with good legislation for education and so on like that. And then you're forced to vote on, you know, whether you're going to have 
vote for the four good parts and and just you know hold your nose for the for the uh, bad part of it and uh, i i think that's just bad government that's bad process we have plenty of time during a legislative session to deal with each issue individually and the the, the five years that i've been up there i've seen it every year at the end of the year uh, the groups that want the bad legislation passed they stick them in other bills they bundle these bills and then we're forced to either take it all along with the, the good along with the bad or uh, vote against the whole thing and uh, uh, I, again I, I think that's that's a terrible way to legislate and uh, I think this is an issue maybe that the League of Women Voters should really take a, a good look at because uh, as I say we have plenty of time to deal with those issues on an individual basis and we don't so Uh, I'd be, oh, I'll, I'll let go ahead. you. Oh, no, no, Representative Johnson, I think uh, in the interest of bipartisanship, I'll go ahead and have you go first. Plus, you were on the K-12 committee, so. Yes, I was. Um, and I want to tell you, I really believe the K-12 through is one of the finest group of people I've ever worked with, um, both sides. Um, it's an interesting committee, and of course, Representative uh, Wynn comes to us from Kansas City, Kansas, and often that district along with the Wichita districts bear the brunt of a lot of, of uh, comments. And so I, I respect that part uh, coming from the area. I lived for much of my life in the area that Representative Wynn uh, now represents. But I will tell you one of the issues on the tuition credits, it's different than the educational funds. That was a bill all by itself. It was very limited, less than, uh, what was it, 0.2% of all students would even be eligible for this. And as I studied it, the Welburn School is right across the street from Christ the King Catholic School. And the failure rate and the achievement level at Welburn is abysmal. And living out there, I could not let my own kids go there. I was fortunate, so they went to Christ the King, did very well. And I see that money coming from private sources. People donate scholarships, it's not state money, and those kids have to have had a failure rate. Uh, and I saw that as separate. In fact, and during the hearing, it was, it was really heartbreaking to me because the gentleman spoke in Spanish and I listened to what he had to say about wanting his two boys to be able to go to Christ the King. And I thought he didn't have the money to do what I did. And I worked an extra job so my kids could go. So I strongly support that part of our educational bill. Secondly, I've talked with Mark Tallman and I find him to be a gentleman when it comes to negotiations on, on behalf of the uh, school boards association. Okay. Uh, we were getting the money that is necessary to fund uh, under Gannon and, and other issues. I think we were gonna get the money for them, which leaves a couple other issues that were in the bill. And how do I break those up to talk to people and explain to them? But I do sense there is a commitment. I'll just share as a Republican, it's gonna come back up when we go. It's coming back before we leave, I'm sure of that. And maybe we'll be able to sort that out uh, and let people speak for those things because I'm committed to education. That's for everybody, not just public schools. That's every school. And in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to get a chance to be a substitute teacher out at Bethany Lutheran School uh, in Johnson County. So I get to go, go back in the classroom. But that's just my thoughts. Thanks. Bethany Lutheran is in my district. It's just a little bit to the north of my house. So um but okay, so to go back to the education bill, it is absolutely going to come back. Uh, you know, when that bill was defeated in the Senate, I thought, oh boy, that completely changes the game. I had originally thought that we might have a short, very short veto session, but um, we're not going to have a short veto session anymore because, uh, because that bill will need to be reworked. And obviously it will look different because um, some things will need to be changed if they are going to uh, get it past both chambers since it failed in the Senate. Um, now, 
as far as I am concerned, I think one of the big problems with that is, is that we run into major issues when you are bundling policy with appropriations. And so uh, I feel like we should just make those basic, uh, you know, appropriations to our, uh, to our education budget and keep that clean of any sort of real philosophical ideas about how we educate our students. Um, but that's just, you know, I, well, I was going to say that's just me. That's obviously not just me, but, um, but obviously the powers that be prefer to sort of bundle those things together. And of course, uh, you know, it's, uh, the, you know, you take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the legislation that we end up dealing with, right? So we see this with our taxation policy as well. Uh, there was a tax bill that I was not particularly fond of that had some really wonderful elements in it, most notably allowing people to itemize their deductions, which most Kansans don't do. Uh, but boy, a lot of people who live in the 19th district sure do like to uh, make itemized deductions. And so, so it is kind of frustrating to see that going through. Obviously, it's a mechanism on behalf of leadership in order to get something passed through. But I think bottom line, that is going to be to end up, you know, being a bit of a fight. And again, we have to see the types of reactions that we get from the second floor, because again, uh, that's the beauty of having this balance where you've got two parties, two chambers, you've got those three branches of government. It really is threading the needle to get legislation through. But I guess a uh, long story long, I do not support having that type of education policy bundled with our appropriations. I prefer a clean appropriations bill and will probably only support a clean appropriations bill. I'm not sure if there's time for me to chat. I don't know how long we're going to be doing this. <laughs> um, I, I Just my, my quick two cents on this. Um, I am childless by choice, um, but it is very important um, as a member of society that uh, all of our children are well educated uh, so that we can continue to have a functioning and uh, you know a great uh, capitalist system that that helps everybody keep moving um, and uh, just being a, a product of both public and private schools um, uh, throughout my life uh, and being married to a man who um, was forced to go to a, a public school that was um, eventually uh, closed because it was so terrible what it did. Um, it, he was fr he's from Indiana, so completely different system of, of schools there. But his um, his brothers were all had the benefit of going to a private school instead, and he's he was the oldest in the family and just had that that difficulty. And he also has um, ADD and severe dyslexia. Was diagnosed early on in life and uh, and really just had to struggle through with his public education. And I will tell you that uh, you know writing spelling. Um, it, it's very, it's still, uh, it, even in our forties, um, a challenge for him. And I think he would have benefited from a public education that was well-funded, that had paras that were, uh, paid properly, that the teachers were paid well, um, and, and, you know, were able to maybe further their education as, as they continue to help teach people like my, my husband, um, and, and make sure that he had the best education possible going forward. I, I think honestly, the, the best education he had, uh, in his life was going through Johnson County Community College where they have a great system in place um, to help people in his position who need specialized uh, attention from teachers and, and outside of the classroom, sometimes extra attention that he needs to do for himself. I, um, you know, it, it's all about advocating for himself in that case. And had a scholarship been available for him through the, the private education uh, system in, uh, in Indiana, maybe that's something he could have taken advantage of. But um, I just don't know that tax dollars being appropriated to that is, is the best way to do it. I think that you, know, that you need to deal with, uh, with private funding um, through fundraising and, and just philanthropy in general. And I don't know that there's a challenge to our, pub, our private schools in Kansas in that regard. I don't know how much money they have. I sure would love to see how much money they have on hand to be able to pay, their, uh, to pay for scholarships and to help more kids out. Is it sitting there? Possibly. Pepperdine University, I graduated from, billions of, they have so much money coming in that they could be giving um, and, and, and helping with scholarships. And in fact, a lot of their, uh, their student uh, body is, uh, is funded through that. So um, we just need to make sure that schools have that opportunity uh, to, to use that money uh, to put towards scholarships instead of having to rely on tax dollars, in my opinion. Thank you. 
And we are unfortunately out of time and won't have time to get, answer any more questions. However, if you didn't get your question asked and you really want to follow up all of their contact information, I'm going to send out in an email now. Um, we always encourage you to do so. Um, follow up, please. They want to hear from you. That's why they're here today. Um, and so I just want to thank our legislators one last time. Thank you for being here on a Saturday morning, giving up your time. And thank you to all of our attendees. You also gave up your Saturday morning. We appreciate it. We think it's important. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.